Welcome in to another edition of Voice in the Kingdom. We're so grateful that you've come across the podcast and have an opportunity to point back to the Father's voice. And there's not just one voice in the kingdom. We want to make sure we hear from all kinds of folks doing kingdom work all over the world. And so these kingdom conversations come out every Wednesday on all the podcast pl platforms. We would love for you to subscribe and share also on YouTube, of course. And we would love for you to subscribe there as well and share it with your friends on social media and all of that good stuff. Well, I'm going to be introducing to you a friend of the ministry, a friend of the program, and someone I call a friend, a uh, friend all the way around, Dr. Grady McMurtry of Creation Worldview Ministries. And every time I get the opportunity to talk to him, I have to point out because he has uh, done a lot of work in a lot of different areas. And I always have to make sure people know that he is a full-time international creation emissary, creationist apologist, extraordinaire, Dr. Grady McMurtry. So... <laughs> How are you doing, brother? Especially that extraordinaire part, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I always like to add that in. Well, brother, uh, good to see you again. You too, man. And I, I'm really excited to have this conversation and a whole new group of people that get an opportunity to see the work the Lord has you doing uh, through Creation Worldview Ministries. And um, one of the things I want to do today, uh, even though I've I've known you for a little while now, I would love for you to share kind of your testimony or origin story, if you will, because we're going to get into some orange origins topics here in a little while. So I thought it might be good for people to hear some of your story today. Well, I am the founder of Creation Worldview Ministries. Uh, however, I grew up as an evolutionist. I actually don't take too deep a breath, but I was born in San Francisco and raised on the campus of Cal Berkeley. Wow. And, uh, you know, you can't get out of Berkeley without being an evolutionist. So I uh, would go on to earn my science degrees, uh, bachelor with honors, master's with honors in evolutionary science. Mm. And I was a teacher of evolution. I believed it. I taught it from the seventh grade to the university level. Uh, however, I did what a good, any good scientist should do. You know, even, even from birth, I was really interested in science. And yeah. a, a good scientist seeks truth. A good scientist does not seek knowledge, if you'll allow that differential. Mm -hmm. Because there's a lot of knowledge out there that's absolutely fake, fabricated, it's a lie, a distortion, etc. Totally deceptive. But I was a seeker of truth. And even when I was an evolutionist, I thought I had found the truth in evolution, but I came to realize I had not. Right. Because I was willing to learn, I was willing to change. And at the age of 27, in a search for truth, I became a Christian. I asked myself the question, was Jesus telling the truth or wasn't he? I mean, it's a simple thing. It's been around for 2,000 years. It's not new with me. Uh, but I took my scholastic academic skills and attacked the problem. And for six months, by myself, without another person specifically guiding me, yes, I read works by others, but, but no one was directing me. Um, and as I look back on it now, I realize it was the Holy Spirit that was directing me, but not, no human being was. And at the end of six months, I came to the conclusion that Jesus was telling the truth. And if, if you're going to seek truth, if you find truth, you must accept it. Mm. Otherwise, you're committing intellectual bigotry. And so I became a Christian in a room entirely by myself. Uh, and I, of course, had a problem because I knew so little about Christianity at the time. You know, uh, being a scientist, you sort of expect a, a checklist at the back of the book, and there isn't one. <laughs> right. So I made an appointment with a, uh, a, a associate pastor of a large church in the area that I live in. And he uh, was kind enough to accept my coming to the scene. And I explained the story at a much longer length. And he, uh, he said, so your decision is firm. And I looked back at him and said, if you knew me, and of course he didn't. But I said, if you knew me, you wouldn't ask that question. And so that kind of took him back, and he thought about it, and he opened up the Bible and said, well, number one, you need to make it public, and showed me where it was. And he said, number two, you need to be baptized, and showed me where it was in the Bible. And I said, fair enough. And in the ensuing weeks, I, I made it public, and I was baptized. But, of course, that just made me a saved evolutionist. Mm. So I had a problem. You know, how, how do you teach evolution and have a personal relationship with the creator of the universe? It's kind of a problem. That's <laughs> a little bit of a mixed bag right there. <laughs> so... Again, I knew I had a problem. You know, I'm smart enough for that. And I spent 16 months studying the issue. Did God use evolution to create what we see around us? And was mm. what I learned and taught others okay? Or 
uh, was, in fact, the Bible correct about a recent creation approximately 6,000 years ago in six literal days. Uh, and so after 16 months, I came to the conclusion, uh, starting with a blank piece of paper, looking at the scientific laws, at the natural processes, at the physical evidence again, which I was very familiar with. Right. Uh, and came to the realization that there is absolutely no truth to evolution whatsoever. It's a fairy tale for, uh, for adults. It's a house of cards. Um, it is believed in as a religion. It's not science. Mm. At that point, I became what is called a biblical scientific creationist, meaning belief in 100% from science and also 100% from the Bible. That creation is true occurred about 6,000 years ago in six days as we experience today. And then I started teaching on it immediately. I would go on to get a couple of doctorates, um, but I've been teaching on the subject now for basically 48 years. Wow. That's a long time to do anything. Uh, <laughs> I haven't been alive that long yet. Uh, but one, no, of the things, <laughs> one of the things that impresses me is that th there's so many, like you said, there's a lot of knowledge out there that can make it seem like somebody truly knows something but there's a lot of fake knowledge and you dug for yourself and found the truth and then said, Hey, I've got to have other people come alongside on this truth and you can hit home in a way that other people can't. So you ended up, so, so how let's ask it like this. How did you then come to the point of creating this ministry around the idea of, of what you came to the, the creation worldview? Well, when we get right down to it, there are, of course, as you know, other larger creation science ministries and smaller ones too, but mm -hmm. but I'm not the only one by a long stretch of the imagination. Uh, but I felt very impressed uh, by the Lord when I became a Christian, that not only was I to be teaching on creation versus evolution, but that I was to be a missionary teacher. Mm. And so I have been teaching on five continents around the world now for for almost 48 years. Initially, I had a tent making ministry. And then eventually, in 1994, it was full time. Hmm. Uh, but what we do is we provide live presentations to small and medium sized churches. We provide a website that has free materials. And I appreciate you putting that up on the screen. But we have over 100 free articles, a small section of technical articles, but most of them are absolutely popular level. Uh, we write for basically sixth grade up. Anybody can read it pretty much. We also have today over 350 free short videos, meaning mm -hmm. minute and a half, five minutes long. Uh, but we're, we're heading towards 400 right now. Yeah. And those are all free. And then we provide, of course, a bookstore with full length videos, full length books and so forth. And we also provide the teaching ministry uh, live. Now we do churches, we do schools, universities, uh, whatever venue that happens to be inviting us to come. Mm -hmm. Matter of fact, we're probably going to be doing a, a VBS this summer up in North Carolina. Uh, and, and so we try to use every venue we can. Mm -hmm. And we do have radio and TV, but not on a regular schedule, but we do regular TV live out of London, England, around the world by internet. Um, roughly every two, three weeks. Yeah. And we do live radio programs on certain stations around the world, as you know, because mm -hmm. you are involved with one. And of course this podcast is really a development from that. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, uh, it's a powerful ministry that, at, that the Lord has allowed you to continue in. And one of the things I want to make sure we touch on today because of what's going on, um, in the world right now with Russia and Ukraine, a big chunk, a big area of your ministry has been in Russia. You've been in Russia a lot from our conversations. That's one of your big ones, kind of where your heart is, if you will. So maybe give us some perspective on your time ministering there, and then even a little bit of perspective on what's going on now. Well, that's a pretty mixed bag. Um, first of all, we do foreign and domestic work. We always mm -hmm. have. Uh, as a matter of fact, even before the ministry was full time back in 91, we made our very first mission trip to Haiti. But since that time, uh, we've been uh, going to over 20 countries. Uh, however, a special burden in 94 for Russia, after all, it had opened up. The Protestantism was just starting to expand. And as of February of this year, I have made 59 mission trips to Russia. Yeah. Unfortunately, it appears I may never be able to go back again. Mm -hmm. And we're dealing with that. 
But I also point out that uh, I have been to Ukraine. As a matter of fact, uh, I've been to Ukraine several times and helped to start what is called the Genesis Institute in Kyiv. And of course, at this point in time, I'm not even sure if it's going to be able to continue at all. Mm. But we've had a serious commitment. Now, we are looking at going to other Russian language countries where we would still be able to minister in the Russian language uh, without going into Russia or Ukraine. Mm -hmm. uh, for instance, so we've been in Kazakhstan a few times. We might go back there. We could go into Turkmenistan, Moldova. Uh, there are on heavy, big, large enclaves of Russian-speaking people in Europe and even here in the United States. Uh, mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, last year we were out in Portland speaking at several churches out there. But there's a, a heavy Russian emphasis in terms of language along the entire northwest coast of the United States. And funny, there's also a nice string of Russian churches along the Gulf Coast in Florida. Hmm. Interesting. Well, um, the, one of the things that I love about what you do is you address in a lot of these presentations, you also have Q&A. So when people, you know, after they hear the presentation, they can ask questions and they can uh, do a lot of uh, give and take there to have your opinion on some things, or actually yours is always more than just an opinion because uh, you're an apologist and a scientist. Uh, that's another thing I like uh, very much about what you do. Um, so for you, for when you go out to these places, whether they're Christian or not, what's one of the first questions that usually comes up? What's the most most popular question that comes up after you've uh, given the presentation? Well, of course, it depends upon the person and situation, but the most common questions, uh, you believe the earth is young? It, it, isn't it millions and billions of years old? Um, didn't the dinosaurs uh, die out 65 million years ago? Uh, you know, they're not mentioned in the Bible. Right. Um, proof for human evolution as th people think it is. And of course, what we do is we show them quite logically and scientifically. There's no truth to human evolution whatsoever. We're not even genetically related to apes. As a matter of fact, from a genetic standpoint, if one were to do genetic comparisons, uh, for example, you're 88% the same as a rat, but you're only 70% the same as an ape. Oh, man. <laughs> uh, you are 70% the same as a, a sea sponge. So who are you closer to? Yeah. Mm. I'll take that one over. a. will take a sea sponge over a rat any day. But this is all based on solid science. You know, yeah. uh, in April, 2003, we completed the human genome project. Mm -hmm. uh, it took us another couple of years to actually complete the ape genome. And this idea that people and apes are 99% the same, it's a simple flat out lie. It was never true. It was never based on science. They just picked that number out of the air. Yeah. But, but even before the Human Genome Project was completed, and we knew very little about the ape genome, uh, evolution already knew it wasn't 99% the same. And the fact of the matter is, the farther we go with research, the more years we add to research, the farther away we know we are genetically. Mm -hmm. And people just don't know. They, they just hear these lies being perpetuated. You have to remember, evolutionists do not have one scientific proof that the Earth and the universe are old. No. Today, we have over 350 scientific proofs that it's young. Yeah. Now, if you're going to do something scientifically, which one would you go with? You see, it's, evolution is a religion believed in by faith, but that's all it is, is a religion. Mm. They, they have five major arguments they use to deceive people into believing that it's all old, but they don't have one proof. I mean, if they had an actual proof, then, again, using intellectual honesty, we would have to agree it's old. But we don't agree it's old, and we have all of this information to refute it, but the public has not been allowed to see it. Yeah. As a matter of fact, you remember uh, Carville's statement about it's the economy stupid. Well, I'm going to tell you right now today, it's the education system stupid. Mm. Because the education system run by the government is not a place of education. It used to be a place of indoctrination, but today it's not even that. Today it's a place of psychological rehab. Mm. Well, one of the things, so when people have this argument about evolution, I was just watching the other day, somebody doing one of those man on the street, you know, they, they put the microphone in your face. Why do you think this way? And somebody asked the question, do you believe in evolution? Because they had previously been having the conversation and the kid said, yes. And he said, why? And he said, because we're similar to apes. 
Yeah. So you you just proved, obviously, with the scientific fact that it's not. So do they just do a better job of narrative than we do? Or I mean, how how is it possible with no proof that they're still having people that believe this stuff is true? Well, it's really quite simple. Um, the the founders of the United States were tremendous men and women. Let's let's face it, you know. Absolutely. I really consider them the greatest generation. And that's no disrespect to the people of World War II because my father and mother were, were a couple of them. Mm -hmm. But nonetheless, they they sacrificed everything to bring the United States and our Constitution and Bill of Rights into existence. Yeah. The problem was they got tired doing so. And they got to the top of the mountain, I'll say, and they went to sleep. And the secular world passed them right by. People don't realize it, but Christians sow the seed of their own destruction mm. because we are tolerant. You see, uh, in Islam, if you will not comply, they will kill you. Yeah, we don't do that. We, don't do that. we have we serve a God of love, right? And so we want you to become Christians. We want you to go to heaven. We will share with you anytime and any place all the reasons. But if you say no, we simply say, well, in that case, have a nice life. You're not going to like it after that, but have a nice life. <laughs> True. And because of our tolerance, we allow uh, non-believers in the population to expand and grow. And today we have allowed them to get to a point where they're in the majority. Now, they started taking over the public education system 200 years ago. People don't realize that. But of course, uh, and I would agree, the large movement to go back to Christian schools and, and home schools and so forth. Uh, not that any one particular one is right for an individual, but that we need to go back to that. Yeah. Because what does God want for us today? Think about Moses for just a moment. I know it seems like it's a sideways thing, but think about Moses for a moment. Why did God arrange it so that Moses will be raised in the house of Pharaoh for 40 years? Because God wanted Moses to have the finest education money he could buy. Hmm. Now, he may have had a speech impediment, but that is not the issue. The right. issue is he had the finest education money could buy. He was a highly intelligent man. Yeah. And that is exactly what God wants for our Christian community today. He wants highly educated young Christian men and women with not only one degree, but possibly two, three, who can go out there and intellectually defend the Christian faith. And it's not just a touchy-feely. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not saying that if you share your faith with Christ with others, it's not a perfectly valid way of winning others to Christ, but it does not work for everybody. And the evolutionists, the atheists, the agnostic wants answers. Yeah. They need the answers about geochronometers proving that the earth and the universe are young, that the millions and billions of years never happened. They need the proof that we are not genetically related to apes whatsoever. And as I've just mentioned, one of the facts of it, but there's a, another thing too. What is the absolutely uh, main argument that every evolutionist uses in an attempt to prove evolution? And why do people think we evolved from apes? Well, it's real simple. They use a false method of proof called the proof by ranking. Mm. R-A-N-K-I-N-G. Now, to rank something means to put it in a logical order or a logical sequence. Now, think with me. Since 1960, they've been using those iconic images of a little ape becoming a bigger ape becoming a person, right? And, of course, yeah. there's lots of funny memes built around it. Right. But, but nonetheless, those basic images have been actually used for 60-plus years as a visual image to convince people they came from apes, right? Yeah. Now, on the surface, it looks logical and plausible, but simply because something is logical or plausible doesn't make it true. Right. Now, to line things up by size and shape doesn't prove that one came from the other. So, for example, if I were to put a unicycle next to a bicycle, next to a motorcycle, next to an automobile, next to a Hummer, you know, did I just prove that Hummers evolved from unicycles? <laughs> no. Well, no, but it's a logical order. Right. And the same thing goes with biology. You see, Evolutionists line things up and then convince you by saying, oh, you see, this one evolved from the other. Well, <laughs> if you've seen special effects movies, you know, mm -hmm. and, and today they're very good. I mean, this is no longer 1938 claymation. Right. And so today the, the mutant movies and, and the Jurassic Park, I think they're on number 63 now. <laughs> um, you know, uh, the, the CG is really very good. Yeah. And you've got to admit it. Uh, and I would admit it, too. But when they line 
let's just say the skull, since we're talking about, say, ape human evolution, that when, mm-hmm. when the skull of a gibbon next to a chimpanzee, next to an orangutan, next to a gorilla, next to a human. And they say, you see how one evolved from the other. Mm-hmm. Well, the tendency of people is to say yes, but actually this is not black magic, it's white magic, it's illusion, it's deception. Because unless you fill in the blanks in between with your own imagination, unless you create a visual thing, a CDI in your own brain, you cannot connect them. Mm-hmm. What you're looking at is simply five objects lined up by size and shape. It proves nothing that one came from the other. Right. And, and using that technique, which is the one they use for everything. I don't care if it's dinosaurs, flowers. Or mm-hmm. um, but using that same technique, I have a challenge for you. Give me 1,000 skulls of 1,000 real different animals. So we'll just deal with mammals uh, or if you, anything that lives on dry land. Um, so you give me the, the skull of a cat, a dog, a horse, a cow, uh, but 1,000 real different animals. I will pick and choose the skulls, and I will line them up and improve by a ranking as evolutions do and prove to you that people did not evolve from apes. What really happened was apes evolved into elephants. <laughs> Or I can take the same pile of skulls and pick and choose and prove to you that people didn't evolve from apes. What really happened was apes evolved into giraffes or whales or anything you want. Because Mm -hmm. if you let me pick them and go from a size and shape to the next one, to the next one, to the next one, it might appear logical. You fill in the blanks of your own imagination. You can see it. But the truth of the matter is, no, you cannot see it. And that's Mm -hmm. why it's white magic. It's deception. Yeah. So for the everyday Christian that may not have the, the gifting or the, the, the brain power to, to become an apologist per se, what would be the best way to have a conversation with somebody that has that worldview that still allows the love of Christ to come forth? It not be just an argument about who's right or wrong, but how to present better what the position of someone is that says, Hey, the earth is 6,000 years old because the Bible told me so. Well, first of all, of course, you have to remember that in talking to somebody who, who is say an atheist, an agnostic Mm -hmm. uh, does not believe the Bible to have any authenticity whatsoever. Right. Then we have to do what the apostle Paul did. You know, in, in Acts, apostle Paul goes to Athens in Acts 17. He does not preach Christ crucified and resurrected first. What does he do when he goes up on top of Mars Hill? He quotes the philosophers. Well, yes, he quotes the Greek philosophers, but then what does he do? He introduces them to the Father, Creator God. Mm. Creator God that's greater than all these other Greek gods put together. And then he says that he has borne witness of this by by a man he has raised from the dead and introduces them to Christ. Mm. If you remember First Corinthians, if you remember Romans chapter one and so forth, um, the preaching of Jesus Christ is it's a stumbling block to a Jew, but it's foolishness to a Greek. Now, when it, that, that word Greek there means anybody that's not Jewish, it also means the evolutionist, hmm. because the the world of Alexander the Great, the Hellenistic world, was a world that believed in evolution that that people evolved, plants, animals evolved, even gods evolved, because gods were not a, a omnipotent God, omniscient God, a one triune God, but there were thousands of gods. And, and so the whole idea of, of Eastern religion was what can I do to placate the gods? Mm-hmm. But Paul says there's, there's one God who is greater than all the rest of these. He's the creator. And then he introduces them to Christ. Because to a Jew, the preaching of Jesus Christ as the promised Messiah was just a stumbling block. They, they already believed in the Father, Creator God. They already believed in creation. They just weren't ready to accept Jesus as the Messiah. Mm. But the preaching of Jesus Christ to an evolutionist is foolishness because if they don't think there's a Father, Creator God, why would they accept the Son? Right. You see, you cannot introduce somebody to the Son of God if they don't think there's a God. Right. And so the first thing we have to do is establish scientifically that creation is true and evolution is false. Now, we have many, many ways we can do that. Now, I, I would caution some people that, that in your zeal to share with others, you have to remember that you could pound your head against the wall, but unless they're willing to learn, they'll never be willing to change. Right. 
So that's the first thing you have to do is determine, are they willing to learn? Because if they're not willing to learn, stop wasting your time and go on to the next person. Well, also what you said early on about your own story, you have to, if you're willing to learn, you have to be willing to change. Exactly. And then you have to find out what, excuse the expression, flicks their back. You know, you, you have to, what are you interested in? You know, there's yeah. no reason to be talking about the reality of dinosaurs existing into a roughly 125 years ago and all the evidence to prove it uh, for somebody that isn't interested in dinosaurs. Right. So, you know, we have to find out what are you most interested in? What topic are you most interested in? And then even if you don't know anything about it, and that's fine, then all you have to do is say, well, you know, I really don't know much about that subject, but I know somebody that does. Mm. And then you come to me, our website, our articles, our videos, or you go to somebody else like us, and you learn something that will answer their question. Yeah. So let's say, they're, let's say they're interested in, in astronomy, for instance. Okay, then um, how come the Earth isn't already cold if it's millions and billions of years old? Why is the moon cold? Why does the sun spin as fast as it does when it should be stopped by now? Uh, why isn't the moon uh, over 300,000 miles away because of it's as old as you say as it should be? Uh, why do we have lumpy rings around planets? Why do we have too much dust in the solar system? Why do we have barred spiral galaxies, which includes our own, by the way? Um, you know, why do we have short period comets still existence? We could go on and on about things like that that are simple mm -hmm. and easy, but you can learn about them and simply say, well, here's some evidence. And if you don't want to learn and share with them, you can get materials. Now, I mentioned astronomy. We have three excellent videos on astronomy, and I say that, and I didn't do it. <laughs> okay, but they're excellent. But there's a guy that's a creationist scientist along with the whole group of people that I'm associated with who was an astronomer with NASA. Yeah. But he's a young Earth, young universe guy. And so he has very good arguments from astronomy. Yeah. as to why the Earth and the universe are young. Or let's go to some other areas that say I would be much more familiar with, like dinosaurs and paleontology or biology and so forth. Because mm -hmm. when you think about some of the basics, when, when I became a, a Christian and started looking at the issue, the last question I asked myself, now how simple is this? At the end of 16 months, I asked myself the question, could the law of gravity ever evolve? Hmm. Now, if you know anything about scientific law, and it doesn't take much, gravity is one of the few true universal constants. Now, many people talk about constants like the speed of light. It's not a constant. Right. We've been able to see it slowing down, literally. But, but there are constants like gravity. Now, could it have ever been anything less than it is? Could it have evolved from something less to be what it is? The answer becomes no. Well, that means it had to come into existence whole and complete. Yeah. I mean, that's just a simple little stumbling block, yeah, right? That's good. But, but I can teach even a child uh, arguments for a young Earth, young universe that totally trip up an evolutionist. One of the ones that I love doing, we have a whole presentation on what happened at the time of the flood, proving that the science and the physical evidence perfectly matches the biblical account. Mm -hmm. It's called the waters cleaved because that's actually what the Hebrew says in chapter seven. Um, but let's think about this for a second. There's um, a place we call the Mississippi River and the Gulf of Mexico, right? Mm -hmm. I think everybody in the United States is familiar with that. Yep. Uh, now, according to evolutionists, the Earth is four and a half, five billion years old. The Mississippi, according to evolutionists, is two million years old. Uh, but there's only 4,500 years worth of mud at the mouth of the Mississippi. Mm. Now, the Gulf of Mexico is a big, empty hole in the ground. If the Mississippi were actually 2 million years old, the Gulf of Mexico would be completely filled in. But it's not. It's a big empty hole in the ground. There's only 4,500 years worth of mud at the mouth. There's only 4,500 years worth of mud at the mouth of all the world's great rivers. And, and I'm talking about uh, the Amazon, Congo, St. Lawrence, Colombia. I don't know what, what Seine, Rhine, Volga, pick one. Yeah. Even the Caspian Sea, which has no outlet. You know, the Volga goes almost all the way across European Russia, empties into the Caspian. It even has an empty hole, not nearly as big, but it's an empty hole in the middle of it because it hasn't been filled in yet. Hmm. Proving that the Volga cannot be millions of years old either. So, I mean, simple little things like that. 
uh, where's the mud? You know, I have maps of the, the world without water. If the earth had been eroding for millions of years, where's the mud? Because it's not there. We have flat sand bottoms right up against the continents, all, all along all the continents. Yeah. So, uh, again, there are the simplest of things that can prove to you it's not old, but it's young. And then that completely unravels all the other conversations that, that are the foundation of what evolutionists use to uh, divide and deceive, really. So. Well, that's just it. If you know anything about how to destroy somebody's argument, and, and when we were in high school or college, we were taught if you're going to destroy somebody's position, you think about it as a table or chair, or something of that nature that has columns, legs, pillars to hold it up. And if you can come up with an argument that knocks out one of those legs, one of those columns, one of those pillars, you, yeah. you destroy the whole philosophy. Well, evolution is a one legged stool, mm. it's the leg of time. And if you can knock time out from underneath everything else falls period yeah there has never been enough time for the evolution process that they believe in to have occurred it's powerful well that's why i like talking to smart guys like you and uh you definitely are my favorite full-time international creation emissary creation apologist i can say that with very much confidence <laughs> <laughs> Well, and, uh, <laughs> you are my favorite Quincy Burke. You know that. Hey, I'll take it. I'll take it. Well, man, I appreciate you coming on and uh, we'll have to do it again. And I know, sure. um, you know, it, it, it's always a pleasure because of the work that you've done uh, to present this in a way that people can understand. And you put, like you mentioned about creationworldview.org, there's so many resources there that don't cost anybody anything other than time to go on there and check it out and learn these things. And you brought up Paul, you know, you're, you're an apologist and a scientist. Paul was pretty sharp, dude. He, he was pretty smart. <laughs> Paul was the first creation evangelist. I, I agree. I'm a creation evangelist. I simply follow him. Yeah. But 2000 years ago, he, he was the first creation evangelist. And that's what I was talking about in Acts 17. Yeah. Well, that's a, that's impressive. And I love it. And I'm excited to be able to point more people to the resources at creationworldview.org. And I uh, look forward to the next time we get to talk. Thanks so much, Dr. Uh, McMurtry, uh, for coming on this program with me again. And uh, always, always welcome. Anytime you desire, brother, just let me know. All right. Well, folks, we thank you for being part of another Kingdom Conversation on Voice in the Kingdom. Make sure you subscribe, uh, you share, you like, you do all of those things on YouTube and your favorite podcast platform. Don't forget to go to uh, voiceinthekingdom.com. Uh, we've got information there about our West Africa Well Project over in uh, Guinea-Bissau. And uh, we've got information there about the tent revivals, the street evangelism, all the other things that Voice in the Kingdom Ministries is doing. And of course, you can always find the podcast there there as well. So thank you for joining us. This has been Voice in the Kingdom.